So we've been in a series now for, this is our third week, and the series is called The Four Questions Now. These are the four questions that Spirit gave me as relevant to us right now to hone in on. So the first week we looked at the question of what if there were nothing to defend? And of course we looked at that in terms of the utopia in the world, right? If there were nothing to defend, like our families or our property and so on, our national boundaries, what would that be like? But of course, we then also looked within. What would it be like if there were nothing to defend? If I wasn't defending my ego, what freedom might I experience? And last week, we asked the question, from which fountains shall I drink? So where should I get my spiritual food? And where, what am I feeding my consciousness? Is it spiritually nutritious or is it otherwise? Is it creating something else for me that I really ultimately don't really want? And so looking at that, when we drink from the fountains that are the fountains of living water, how much that feeds our soul and allows us to, to be prepared for the challenges of life as well as to attract the joys of life. So today our question is, what serves the highest and best good? Now, this is a question that can be sort of the, the heartbeat of our life, right? It can be a question that we're constantly asking, one that is, is the essence of how we live and how we show up in general. It can also be a question that we ask in the moment, a question that we ask of spirit within us right before we respond, right before we speak, right before we act. I usually shorten it in those moments to just what serves, because I know what I mean by that. What serves the best and highest good? So just what serves? And just to take that moment before acting can really make a big difference in the outcome. So the answer to this question can be as varied as there are individuals. Everyone in our community will have a slightly different variance of what serves the best and highest good for them in general in their lives and, and right now in these moments. So I've taken the liberty to just hone in on a couple that I think all of us will maybe feel a little bit of a kinship with or a resonance. And so the first is our commitment to awaken. What serves the best and highest good? How could it be any better than to be, stay committed to spiritually awaken? And the second is our kindness, how we show up as a kind being. So let's unpack this a little bit together, starting with the idea of awakening. Our spiritual awakening is at the heart of what draws us together as a community, right? We exist as a spiritual community in large part because we want to wake up. We want to be more spiritual beings. We want support for our spiritual journey. And so that's part of why we even are here together. And when we make the commitment to awaken, it's like automatically we're pointed to those places that will help us. If we say what I really want in life is to wake up spiritually, then, then we'll receive the guidance, we'll be pointed to what we need and, and we'll be given that which will help us awaken. And if we keep bringing that intention forward, it will keep showing up in that way for us. So that's one of the key ways. And when we're guided, then we're constantly guided and pointed to that innate divinity, right? So when we're pointed to that innate divinity, then we're really being guided to show up like God. I mean, what could serve the highest and best good any better than us being the embodiment of the divine? That's really the point, ultimately, for us. So... Most of us would, would say that we're not really a finished work of art, right? We're not really there yet. We're sort of in the, the making. And, and if you will, we're kind of like the, the, the clay in the divine potter's hands, right? So we have to, there, there needs to be a willingness to be that. There needs to be a willingness to let ourselves be crafted and shaped and remembered, and, and in order to do that, uh, to, we have to turn something over. It's that spiritual word that we love to use, surrender. It's the thing that the mystics always point us to. The key to our awakening is to surrender, is to give over, not to give up. That's not what spiritual surrender is. It's not raising the, the white flag and giving up. It's giving over to the very highest part of us, to the allness of God, to that S, you know, the big S source or the big G God. It's that, that that is everywhere present that we speak of, that that is everywhere powerful, giving over to that. 
I know that some people, you know, have a hard time with the word surrender. I know at least one person in our community has told me that, so I'm guessing there are others then. So, so just to remember that, that it is this, this allowance, this giving space to and room for spirit to move in our lives. That's what surrender is. It's, it's thinking that we're not, it's not, we're giving up control, right? That's what we're surrendering to. We're giving up the control or the idea that the thoughts of our intellectual mind is it, that that is really w what exists. That's really what we're acting from. But there's so much more. And so if we give over to that so much more, we will experience it. It takes a willingness to let go of control. And that can be a hard one for a lot of us. It's certainly something the ego likes to have um, in, in place. I'll never forget when I was led by a series of spiritual experiences to read the book, The Interior Castle by St. Teresa of Avila. St. Teresa is a renowned, in, in, she's a doctor. She was made a, a doctor of the church in, in the in Catholicism, which is a really big high honor, even, you know, it kind of next to sainthood, there's this other honor that's bestowed on very few women mystics, and St. Teresa of Avila is one of them. And as I was reading this book about the, the layers and the pathways, the seven pathways in to the divinity within us in this interior castle, there were all those words on the pages and all those chapters and all those layers to, to move through. There was this one word sentence, surrender, period. And it stood out on the page like a pillar all by itself. You know, it's as if all the other words just sort of fell away. And that one word shone really bright. And I read it, and then I read it aloud, and then I reread it again. And it was that, that teaching that, that made me realize that this is what the sages and the mystics of the ages always send us to. They point us to surrender as the key to awakening. Surrender is the key to discovering divinity. So it's a really, obviously, a big piece in our process. But so how do we do that? Then how do we begin to surrender? That's, it can be kind of hard, right? As somebody pointed out, it can be hard to, to give up that kind of control. We always sort of want to let it go and then take it back, right? <laughs> let it go and take it back. Anybody ever do that? Um, I certainly have had that experience a lot. So how do we allow ourselves then to, to build up really what we need is a trusting relationship with the divine, right? We need to build the trust. And just like in our interpersonal relationships, what do we do to build trust? You know, to have a good, healthy relationship, we build trust and, by, and to, to build that relationship and that trust, we usually have clear and frequent communication. That's usually a key piece of it. It is the same with the God of our being. To have clear and frequent communication is what allows us then to have trust. And when we have trust, it's easier for us to give over and have more of that presence in our life, which will cause our awakening. So it's just that, that constant movement then, that willingness to, to listen, to listen to the, the God that is in the midst of us, to, and to even converse, to ask questions, to speak to God as if God is this beloved or God is this friend in whatever ways that feels natural and authentic for you. It's where we make the conscious contact, you know. For many of us, it's in the pause, it's in the quiet, it's in the times of meditation. It can also be, though, in movement. It can also be in action, especially if that movement and that action has an intentionality to it to be fully present. You know, so things like practices like Qigong or yoga can have that. Sort of they're naturally, the martial arts have that kind of naturally built into them. But we can also apply it to things we love to do. We can have that sense when we dance. We can have that sense when we swim or when we run or hike. You know, anything that is sort of movement and action can also bring us to that kind of communication, that kind of presence, building that relationship of trust. Another important aspect to think about that really supports us is location. And if you think about where, it, what's your sanctuary? Where is the sanctuary that you go to and you really feel that? You really feel the presence. You're really open to this truth that is available to you. You can begin to have that conversation or that listening space. For a lot of us, it's nature, right? Your favorite places in nature, a mountain stream or the mountains themselves or 
ocean, lakes, you know, your favorite trees. It can also be things that have been shaped by humans, you know, cathedrals and cemeteries for some. It can also be your favorite chair at home, you know, or man-made gardens, which also, of course, are part of nature's beauty. So, so think about what it is, what is your sanctuary, what is your place, and when we make that a habit, that's my place I go to, where I feel the quiet, where I feel the connection, where I have a trust and a familiarity, then it opens us even more and more to, to have that experience. So, I, you know, and you can make it out of anything. It doesn't have to be overtly beautiful or overtly spiritual. You know, I remember when I worked at the Teachers Academy for Math and Science, our building was right across from the projects and the low-income housing projects in Chicago. And I, on my lunch breaks, I would just go out and meditate on a park bench, you know. And, and there I could still, because it was my place, I just made it my sanctuary. If I opened my eyes, it didn't look like a beautiful sanctuary, but it didn't matter. So it can also be made for us in that way um, by us making it so. After I worked there, I ended up at Silent Unity at Unity Village. So I was living and working in a place that was beautiful and that was overtly spiritual. And maybe it's because of that or maybe for various reasons, but it had been about seven years uh, since my dad had made his transition. And he started showing up for me there. I would take uh, my breaks in the Rose Garden at Unity Village. And if you've ever been to the Unity Village, you know how beautiful the Rose Garden is. And I would always sit by, at this one bench that was, it had salmon colored roses all behind it. And that was um, a kind of rose that my dad really liked to plant. So maybe that was part of it. Maybe it was just because I needed him in my life right then. You know, I needed to have that conversation. I don't know, but it was this place most often where I had these kinds of conversations with him for the first time and began to really uh, talk to him through the veil of of the other side to this world, and it, it was it was really a beautiful time of of just receiving and and maybe even giving. I don't know. I'm not sure how that works on the other side, um, but it was really rich. And so that location seemed to be a part of it. That place that I had made my my place of of conversation, my place of connection, my place of feeling the presence, and having a kind of communication with my father that was far more conscious than I think it could have ever been in, in life, in physical life on earth. So it's, it's that, it's, it's kind of the same thing. You know, I, what I would do is just go and sit and wait quietly, and then he would show up. And it's kind of the same for us, isn't it? We go to those places and we sit quietly and we wait and then God shows up. And then we have that kind of trust building conversation happening so that the voice becomes familiar, the feel becomes familiar, the sense of it is there for us. That's something then we carry throughout our day and it's easier then for us to access it and it's easier for us to give over to it, to surrender to it to allow it to take charge of our lives. So this is a, a big part of, of where we are, you know, in our journey. The divine is um, always rooting for us, I think, for the best and highest good to show up through us and as us. And being attuned to the one undoubtedly gives it to us. Right now, there's a basically a twofold. I mean, I think there's probably many other prongs and aspects of this, but it's clearly there's a twofold wake up call that's happening that's in the collective consciousness. One is through this pandemic, right? That's giving us an opportunity. It's a wake up call giving us an opportunity for this internal time. You know, it's as if we were given this, you know, from March to about June in our area anyway. And then we were beginning to come out and emerge and do our thing and open up. And then it was as, as if the divine intelligence of the universe said, uh, no, they're not ready. So uh, back we go. 
<laughs> into this more internal space again. And I know it can be hard for a lot of people and my heart really breaks for those who are experiencing a lot of loneliness, who maybe live alone right now. And, and so we extend the best we can, you know, the, the most um, we can to one another through the online formats to have that connection ex experience for all of us. So, so it is this, um, it is this, the pandemic, as one of the things that is waking us up, this time of internal space, of turning within, the opportunity anyway to wake up. And then, of course, there is also this wake-up call that's happened around racial injustice. I don't think it's any really mistake that the events of George Floyd's death happened on Memorial Day weekend. You know, it's like, remember, it's sort of like, wake up, remember, you know, there's this sense of, of remembering happening, remembering I, our ideals, you know, with liberty and justice for all, for example, remembering who we are as, as, a, as in our oneness, remembering that we are working together for the good of all, the greater good that includes everyone. All of that gives us an opportunity to wake up again, uh, yet another opportunity. It's not that it wasn't there. I mean, it's been there for 400 years, right, to, or plus, to wake up. Um, yet, I don't know, many of us were maybe too busy or too tired or too comfortable to really pay attention. And now it's like, oh, yeah, I kind of knew that, but I didn't really fully know the extent until I stopped in a pandemic and had a little more time to look and pay attention. God knows what she's doing. It's hard. It's hard to be where we are, but we're in it together. And so it's a little bit different than just the personal journey. This is different when we have this sort of worldwide things happening that we can't help but not pay attention to because it's everywhere present and it's resounding inside of us. Wake up. <laughs> And we're listening, I think, a lot of us. We're listening. We're beginning to understand. We're beginning to awaken. So let's just listen. That's the key, isn't it? When we listen, we will wake up further. Christy Linné sings this beautiful song to wake us up. She says it's time to wake up. That's for sure. Let's listen. Let's enjoy the music and the message in the song. All right. So uh, this song is song called Wake Up and it's the first song that I wrote in the pandemic um, when everything shut down and you know there was little me in my log cabin in the mountains of North Carolina um, just uh, sitting there and contemplating well, what does this mean for us as you know the species of, of, of human beings you know what does it mean for us right now and I think in my opinion it's an opportunity to wake up and, and you know, take a second look at the way we've been living our lives and see if there's anything we might need to shift around a little bit. I know I've had a lot of shifts. <laughs> um, and this is a song about that. It's called Wake Up. Feel the pain go numb to cold I can't hide the emptiness Or find a way to fill this hole It's just the end of winter Springtime feels far away It starts with just a seed To build a forest in the gray It's time to Now the spark becomes a sun. Whoa. 
What is it we're calling now? What will we become? It's time to wake up, wake up now. Time to wake up, wake up now. Shine the light of the love down. Time to wake up, shake it out. Live the life we've been dreaming now. Wake up, hear the call. Consuming humankind Can we come back to our hearts And get out of our minds a Craving soul connection But I feel so far away Corona's in the sky There's a halo in the gate It's time to wake up Wake up now Time to Shine the light of the love down Time to wake up, shake it out Live the life you've been dreaming now Time to wake up, shake it out Live the life you've been dreaming now Time to wake up, shake it out Live the life you've been dreaming now Wake up, hear the call Wake Wake up. Well, thanks so much to Christy for that beautiful song. You know, she made that just for us. And uh, I think it's a song that isn't yet uh, recorded on her newest album. So. Um, thanks, Christy, for the sneak preview. That was a really cool song. So I mentioned that uh, St. Teresa of Avila a little bit earlier, and St. Teresa of Avila was also somebody who talked about how w um, waking up, being enlightened, wasn't, it wasn't for the bliss of it. You know, it wasn't for the experience of just simply being free or being, you know, having that, that individual experience of liberation. It, it is then what do you do with it? <laughs> That's not the end game. The end game is what do you do with it? How do you serve? How do you share it? How do you show up as, as this one who's, who's helping others then it, it awaken themselves, to shine the light themselves? So it never ends until, you know, it never ends, right? <laughs> but it doesn't end just with our own spiritual goodies, so to speak. It, it's always about the sharing, right? If we are awakened to the fact that we are a divine being, what does the divinity do? It gives, it is loving, it is kind. So as we then think about what is the, what does it mean then? What does it look like? What might be an aspect? What would serve the best and highest good and ideal of how we show up? Well, love comes to mind, right? Love is of the highest order. It is the supreme. Love is the one when we can fall in love in a universal way, when we can love everybody with a, a genuine kind of love, well, then we've really arrived. It, love can also be sort of hard to put our arms around, though, love itself. You know, it's, it's, um, it's so big. It's so vast. So I find that kindness is a little bit easier to put our hands around, a little bit easier to understand, to know, okay, I know how to practice kindness. I'm not sure how to practice love exactly, but I do know how to practice kindness. And so I was, you know, because I work at home and Brenly works at home now, we're interacting more and hearing each other while we work. And, and so as I'm writing talks, I'm asking her questions more often. And I said, you know, how would you describe kindness? And it, right at that moment, she was getting a popsicle out of the freezer. And it was the last of our, both of our favorite flavor, this really, um, it's pineapple, but it's got chunks of pineapple in it, and it tastes really fresh, and it doesn't have a lot of added stuff. And uh, it was 105 degrees. I might mention that as well. So it's very refreshing. And so she's walking over to me saying, I don't think you can describe kindness as she's, 
putting the popsicle toward my mouth. And so I take a bite, a sublime bite of this popsicle, and then she offers me another, and then she walks away. And I think she was oblivious to the fact that she just showed me kindness, you know? So it is in those, it is in the actions. I mean, she's a woman of action too, less so of words. So, uh, so I get the gift in that as well. But, you know, it's, it's, um, it's that, right, isn't it? It's those small acts of kindness that really make a big difference. So that's, you know, it is also, kindness is also about commitment, like the commitment to awaken. If we commit to kindness, you know, it shows up for us in times when maybe somebody else isn't being kind, but we're still able to access it within us when they can't access it for themselves. We're still able to, to hold the commitment that I will continue to be kind, even if you're not being kind in return. So Jack Cornfield, the beloved teacher and author, many of you know, he's one of the founders um, and, and a regular teacher at Spirit Rock, not too far from us. He tells a story about when he was a seventh grade teacher about this particular student. Shay was one of his, his students, and, and he said that she was his most difficult student, that she couldn't even follow the most basic of directions, like stay in your seat or raise your hand when you have a question, you know. It's not that she couldn't, she wouldn't. <laughs> and so he said that we were always jockeying for who's going to control the classroom, me or Shay, you know. And he tried everything he knew to try. He tried incentives. He tried consequences. He called her home every week, but no one ever answered. He learned that she was being raised by her older sister. He was just at his wit's end, so he went to the school counselor and he told the school counselor everything he tried. And the school counselor said, we can have her transferred. You've done your due diligence. We'll have her transferred to another classroom. And he said, but I can't do that. She's my student. And so he shared that in the teacher's lounge. And the teachers were <laughs> very, very grateful um, that he was willing to, to keep this student. So he said it was the last day of seventh grade. And Shay scurried out of the classroom ahead of the other students, and the classroom was now empty. And he was sitting there contemplating his failures, the ways that he had not really served this child. And she came back in. And she said, I, I couldn't think of anything to give you. This is the only thing I could think of. And she handed him this slightly misshapen bowl, the kind he said that kids make in art class. And he turned it over, and it had her initials etched in it. And she said, thanks for trying to like me, and then she left. And he said he just sat there with that bowl, and he said he went on to be a school principal and a school superintendent, and everywhere he was, in every office he was in, at every desk, he always had that misshapen bowl with Shay's initials on the back and the remembrance of, thanks for trying to like me. If we can offer an olive branch, you know, if we can offer somebody a patch of blue sky, somebody who's darkened in their hearts or disappointed by life, crushed by lack of disappointment, if we can be the ones who say, I'll take that high road of kindness, I'll commit to kindness in every situation without knowing what a person's circumstances are, I'll still be the presence of God. I'll still be the presence of kindness. What a world we can make by each of us making that kind of commitment. Will we keep it every time? Of course not. We're going to have our times when it just doesn't show up for us in that way because we're going through our own stuff. But if we make the commitment, we come back to it time and time again, like anything we practice, and we can be more effective at being kind and kind to ourselves, by the way in the process. So kindness is really, I think, something for all of us to aspire to. You know, Jack also acted from a sense of responsibility, an ability to respond to the situation. He wouldn't pass it off on someone else. And a lot of us would gladly, right? We've got a problem and somebody else could take it. Gladly we'll pass it on. But to him, it was given to him. It, this, this student was part of his classroom part of his work to do. And so he, he took that on as a responsibility and a resolve for kindness. 
He also tapped, as, as we know who he is, I'm sure, tapped that inner reservoir of kindness. You know, when we have all that quiet time we talked about earlier, all that, that practice of awakening, we build that reservoir of these kinds of spiritual traits like kindness, and we can tap it then when we need it. Niceness is not to be confused with kindness. I think that's really an important point. Niceness doesn't always serve. It sort of can serve in a cursory way. Yes, you know, we want people to be polite and nice, but it, it, it just, um, it has something uh, shallow in it, or it can have something shallow in it, that kindness, where kindness has a depth. I was talking to my niece, Nicole, a couple of days ago on the phone, and she said, everybody always says I'm nice. She said, you know, and then we started talking about nice versus kind. And she said, yeah, she said, I don't want to be nice. I want to be kind. Me too. Me too. So authentic kindness keeps us intact. You know, then we're not acting out of this sense of shoulds or appropriateness or politeness. And I'm not saying those things aren't good. <laughs> it's good for us to be a pol polite and appropriate. But it can also shield us in a way. It can keep us in that sort of tame, domesticated space that kindness lets us step out of and be in a more authentic space, a, a real space that people can really feel the difference um, between the two, I think, when receiving it. You know how it feels to receive so you know what it feels like to receive small acts of genuine kindness, or big ones for that matter. So genuine, genuine kindness is really a keeper for us, I think, on this journey. It really informs this question, what serves the best and highest good? It's these two things, right? Our commitment to waking up spiritually and our commitment to being a kind human being. With these two in our pocket, in our hearts, there's nothing that can stop us from really creating the world that all of us envision. So let's, as we move together throughout this week, let's hold these ideas in consciousness, maybe work with this affirmation in your own quiet times. So together, let's speak this truth. I serve the highest good by waking up and being kind. And so it is. Bless you.